perform worse than um, the, other, the other kernels. The format that we actually recommend in, um, in practice for most meshes is what we call a hybrid format. And this is one that actually segments the matrix into two portions. I told you earlier that irregularity is fine if the regular case is the common case. And this is an example of exactly that. The ELL kernel I told you about uh, gets very good memory access patterns. The problem is it wastes space if some rows are very long with respect to others. The coordinate format I just told you about doesn't really care what the row length distribution is. But, as I'll show you in a minute, performs at a substantially lower level than the ELL or vector kernels. The ideal is really to combine these two things. I can pick some k that I'll call the typical row length and I'll pack all the non-zeros up to size k into an ELL portion of the matrix, which you see on the left there, and in, in orange. And then I'll take all the exceptional entries that fall off the edge and I'll store them in a coordinate format off on the side. And then to perform the matrix vector product, I'll actually launch two operations, one to do the ELL part, one to do the COO part. And this is actually for most well-behaved, you know, finite elements, stencil meshes, this is the, the uh, the best performing kernel that we currently have. So uh, this just kind of summarizes some of the different ones I've told you about. Um, the only one on this diagram I didn't tell you about is the diagonal kernel that's, that's specialized for diagonal matrices. I didn't tell you about that because it looks almost identical to the ELL kernel with just some little tweaks. So it's really not worth talking about. But the point that you should take away from this, uh, and I'm going to back this up with some numbers shortly, is that for problems like this, especially problems that are sparse and irregular, it's important to customize the approach you take to what you know about the data. If I know it's a diagonal matrix, I should definitely use a diagonal format. If I know it is a pathological social network, I should probably use a coordinate format that's going to be very insensitive to the row length distribution. And for things in the middle, I actually want to use, like, say, our hybrid format. Okay, so I said I wanted to back that up with numbers, but before I show you the numbers, any, any questions about the, the techniques I just described? I see at least one. Actually, I don't hear anything. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so my uh, question is related to sparse matrix matrix operations as opposed to this spe specific case. So yes. typically, they involve fill-in, and so my question is, which of these uh, uh, layouts minimize the fill-in if you are doing say matrix matrix operations as opposed to matrix vector? That's an excellent question and one which I don't have a great answer for at the moment. That's still something that we're working on. You're right, that sparse matrix matrix is much harder in general than sparse matrix vector. The reason is this. For sparse matrix vector or sparse matrix dense matrix product, I know exactly what the sparsity pattern of the output will be. And that's a great help in designing efficient code. The general sparse matrix matrix problem is one where I have no idea, potentially, what the sparsity pattern of the output is. At the moment, uh, I don't have a great technique for the general case of sparse matrix matrix where I have no idea what the output pattern is. Um, at the moment, we do have some kernels implemented in, in the library that use some uh, basically sort and segment reduction kind of techniques. I'm hoping we can do better than that, but uh, I'm not sure actually. The, um, if, if you have the special case of sparse matrix dense matrix, uh, actually, any of these any of these formats would be reasonably well suited. I would say, you know, it, it basically it depends again on the sparsity pattern of, of the matrix you're given. By the way, uh, if you have has a question. How to do sparse matrix matrix? Please, please tell me. Please tell me. <laughs> uh, has a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, for the hybrid format. So how do you determine the, the, where you cut it off? Like, uh, If you look in our paper, we actually have a, a little heuristic that decides where to cut it off. 
Uh, essentially, what it comes down to is we, we empirically measure the difference in, in cost between the ELL and the coordinate format. And we try and pick the appropriate K based on the incremental cost of having uh, an entry fall over into the exceptional case. And so it's fairly simple, and, and the library that we have online um, you know, implements it. And it's typically not something you really need to be too concerned about. But yeah, if you look at the paper, it says exactly how we do it. OK, all right, thanks. And, I, and I'm evading your question, because I don't remember the exact formula. <laughs> uh, I have one uh, question, too. So uh, for uh, sparse matrix multiplication, do you have, is there, what is the, 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 uh, the, the sparsity that's actually worded to go into the sparse matrix multiplication rather as opposed to dense matrix? And the second question is, can we actually, for the general case, do some kind of rearrangement of the data so they are close to the diagonal, so the matrix is maybe diagonally dominant, and then maybe em uh, employ the dense matrix techniques? Um, so uh, the, when it makes sense to use sparse matrix methods, I would argue a rough rule of thumb is if you have an order n number of entries in the matrix, then it, you should use a sparse method. And if you have a quadratic number of entries, you should use a dense matrix method. Um, exactly where the dividing line is you know, depends on the specific performance characteristics of the kernels you have on the hardware you're given. Uh, but broadly speaking, that's the heuristic I would use. Um, so let's say I have, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting. Let's say I have a matrix that is 90% uh, uh, sparse, so 10% so is non-zero for the, for the whole matrix. So is it worth it to do uh, empl uh, sparse, or I should go for the dense matrix? In most cases, it's probably better to go with the sparse method purely for space. Right? The, 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 num the size of the matrix you're, you're able to fit in your DRAM will be severely constrained if you go with the dense method. But if it's small enough, maybe you're OK with that. And, and for a particular architecture, maybe you would actually get better performance overall with the dense method. It depends, as with most, as with most problems. <laughs> Uh, regarding the other question, um, you know, can't you reorder the matrix so it's a little nicer and then use what amounts to a dense method? Uh, the diagonal and ELL kernel, kernels that I told you about, I mean, that's more or less what they do. Uh, the only difference between that and an actual dense method is that you're doing a gather from the X vector rather than having ev all your data accesses lined up. Uh, but yeah, you could, you could certainly reorder the matrix and potentially get better performance if it was given to you in a very bad order, but could be reordered so it was very well behaved. Uh, we've, we've taken the approach of trying to write kernels without attempting to do any matrix-specific reordering, because you know sometimes you have to process the data you're given. You don't always have the luxury of thinking about it and chewing on it and reformatting it in some completely new order, <laughs> necessarily. If you, are, if you do have that luxury, it's something you should consider. Any other questions before we get to the numbers? Okay. I think there's a question in the room. Yes. Yeah. Have you looked into some of the methods, like, if I remember, like reverse Cartier Marquis, that used to tend to push your, your skyline quotes, which means might improve the performance of the ELL as you select? Yeah, so. Uh, have you been doing the Actual. Yeah, so I, I alluded to the you know the possibility of getting better performance by reordering, and, and RCM, reverse Gotham key, is one of the reorderings that you might use. Um, with the uh, with the current method, you know, mostly what you're getting a benefit from by reordering is you can get a better gather access pattern to your vector. Um, there are, however, some other variant formats like uh, the jagged diagonal format that if you do reorder them in, in the way you describe, then you can reduce the amount of wastage by having essentially bands of varying K over your rows. And if you can bring them together so that you, know, you have kind of a cluster where one value of K makes sense and another value of K makes sense, uh, perfectly reasonable thing to do. Yes? Could you repeat that question? Because I didn't hear it for a moment. Uh, I, I think I more or less summarized the question in the preface to my comment. Oh. 
I don't think you missed anything. Mm. <clears throat> I have one comment from Illinois. This is from Lawrence Cleveland. Yes. Oh, sorry, we have, uh, yes. Question is, how does the hybrid format work for data with a power law distribution? I'm going to show you in, in a second. OK. Well, you mean like how does it perform, right? Yes, I believe so. <laughs> yep. Wait, wait a couple minutes, and you'll see. All right. <laughs> so speaking of that, uh, I wanted to show you some performance results so you get some sense of, of how this behaves in practice. So what I'm going to show you is benchmarks that we ran on a Tesla C2050 card. And the relevant number here is the peak bandwidth of that card, which is 144 gigabytes per second. Because as I said, these kernels are completely bandwidth limited. Uh, so the, the peak gigaflops is almost irrelevant, because we're not going to come anywhere close to it anyway. Everything I'm going to show you is all measured in double precision. And all of, this data, uh, all of this data is collected for versions of the kernel that place the X vector uh, in a texture and access it via texture accesses to get slightly better cache performance. Uh, and I'm going to show you two sets of data, one on structured matrices and one on unstructured matrices. So first, structure. So remember, structured matrices, by that I mean you know, it has some number of diagonals. I'm going to jump in and ask a quick question here. You say uh, you're using the texture cache on a Fermi generation chip. Have you played with the L1 cache yet? This yes. Grade? Yes, I have. Um, does, it, does it perform well or not so well? The L1 cache performs well, but it performs differently. Um, and overall, we get somewhat better performance by using texture as well as L1. And I was, I was somewhat disappointed by that, because I, I wanted to say, well, I'd really rather just not put stuff in textures and just use the L1 cache. But uh, when I thought about it, you know, it's not that surprising. By using the texture cache in addition to L1, we're essentially boosting the aggregate amount of on-chip cache that we have access to. Right? And it seems reasonable to expect that if you use both the L1 and the texture cache, since they're not physically the same cache, you have increased the total cache pool that you're accessing, and therefore you'd expect to get somewhat better performance. And that is indeed what we seem to experience. All right, thanks. There are actually some matrices that not using texture and only using L1 actually works better on Fermi. Uh, and I think that that has to do with essentially how friendly the data access pattern is for L1 versus texture, because of course they're optimized for different things. OK, so this is a structured matrix data set. Uh, it's a synthetic data set, which is just constructed from Laplacian stencils on regular grids. And uh, if you look at the bottom, each one of them is labeled like 3 point, 5 point. That's, that's the size of the stencil. And so hence also the number of diagonals in the matrix. So as you go from left to right, you have matrices with increasing numbers of diagonals. And uh, if you look at the top, not surprisingly, the diagonal kernel, which is customized for this specific problem. Actually, I'm on the wrong slide, aren't I? Customized for this specific problem is the one that performs the best. The ELL kernel is not quite as good. And the others perform noticeably worse. And again, this makes perfect sense, right? The things that like structured matrices best work best. Uh, so it's always good to have a little sanity check that that's true. <laughs> The other thing you'll notice from this graph, if you look at the bottom, that orange box is the scalar CSR kernel. And you'll notice that its level of performance is consistently decreasing as the number of diagonals increases. And the reason for that is that as the number of diagonals increases, the number of entries per row increases. Consequently, the stride in the memory access pattern between consecutive threads increases, because that stride is exactly the number of non-zeros per row. So what you see there is that as the stride increases from 3 to 27, you get sort of 1 over n behavior in, in your performance. And I would argue that's exactly what you should expect, given the way the current hardware behaves. So again, it's always nice to see that it, uh, it does tend to verify what we would expect. <laughs> uh, you'll also notice that you know, the number of gigaflops we're achieving here is it's under 20. 